chapter 17 is property valuation. If we all if we all have like kind houses, the appraiser's job is not too difficult. Okay. It's relatively easy. Um, they just do a comparison, and we'll talk about sales comparison approach later, and then just find out the average price of like kind houses. But what if it's a church? What happens at your local church? How do I find like kind churches that have been built at the same time, same age, everything else? That's kind of like a unique property, right? You can't, it's hard to find comps for that. What about a post office? Post office or a school, right? How do we find value in that? How do we find, how's, as an appraiser, now think in the appraiser's eyes, how do we find value in that? So they have to figure that out. So that there are three different approaches. The first one is the sales comparison approach, which is where we just compare sales and that's good for residential property and vacant land. Easy peasy, not too difficult. The second one is a cost approach. So that's for unique properties. And what that does is it takes a look at these unique properties and figures out how much it would cost to replace that property and then takes off um, depreciation because we need a value. What's it worth today as it's standing? So we would deduct off value um, depreciation. And then the third, pro the third, what if it's an, if I have five condos that are producing income, making money, how do I get a value of those properties? So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the um, gross income approach and that'll take us, um, that'll get us through there. And it'll mean, well, when we look at the gross income approach, we want to see how much, um, what our expected rate of return is. Y'all, when you put money in a CD or you put money in the bank, you expect some money back, right? If you buy stocks, you expect to get some money back. You expect a certain amount, right? I can put my money in a, you know, in a savings account and get 2% off of it or whatever they're paying now, it's not much. But if I'm gonna invest it in a business, don't I want 10, 15% on my money? So how much am I willing to invest based on the net income for that property? And that's called a gross income multiplier, right? And gross income approach. So we'll do that too. That's the third approach. So those are the three we're gonna talk about. Appraisal's got a pretty tough job, not easy. And they have to go with the market trend. And usually, if the housing is a, a lagging indicator, usually we're the last to know. So we have to be able to do those things. So let's talk about the definition of an appraisal. And an appraisal is an opinion of a property's market value on a specific date derived by using established guidelines performed by a licensed appraiser. Now, let me ask this question Do the market ch markets change? minute by minute, right? So if I go out and I'm an appraiser today and I do this appraisal, could the value be different tomorrow? Or could today's value be different than yesterday's? Sure, markets change, right, every day. So this is like your company's balance sheet. This is the one that says, this is a snapshot of what today's business looks like. And that's what an appraisal does. It is an opinion of value that's given to the, um, usually the bank requires this, okay? And that's their that's their one single opinion of value. I think this house is worth $275,421, okay? And that's the opinion of value. That's the way that works. Now, through, obviously, they've done their homework. They've taken a lot of classes. It's not, they just didn't fall up a turnip truck and become an appraiser. They've had to do a lot of classwork and a lot of um, experience points and things of that nature. So you don't just happen. So an appraisal can only be done by a licensed appraiser. You cannot do one as a um, as an agent. Okay, you can do what's called a um, comparative market analysis or a competitive market analysis. Either one. We'll show you how that works. All right, and you're going to find a probable sales price or a range of prices. Okay, or a range of prices. Now. When you become a full broker, you may get hired by a bank to go out and do a broker price opinion. And you're gonna do them the same way, only you're gonna have a little more experience and they're gonna ask for a few other things. Um, and you might be able to make a few bucks doing these for some banks, all right? But again, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna look for a probable sales price. Or, in a, well, in a, in a BPO, you're gonna look for a probable sales price also, but in a CMA, you can also um, get a range of prices. 
going to sell between 150 and 160 thousand dollars somewhere in there. So if you're doing that, that's okay for us to be able to give them that, right? And we're going to give them a probable sales price because based on all the comparisons. So that's what we're going to do, and we'll figure out something as we go through it. And we'll do some examples of this. So there are four characteristics of value. The acronym is DUST, D-U-S-T, and it stands for Demand, Utility, Scarcity, Transferability. The first is demand. If nobody wants anything, does it have any value? Anybody have a rotary phone anymore? Right? Nobody has one. It's not, it doesn't have any value. Can't use it. There's no demand. Nobody wants one. Right? Or how about a the second version of PlayStation? Does anybody want the second version of PlayStation? No real demand. How much is the demand for PS5 if you're a gamer? Right? The, the demand is very, very high. So the price is very high, right? So there is value to the newer level of games, okay? Now, the second part of that is utility. How does this help me? Does it satisfy my needs? Well, if I'm a gamer and I can get my hands on a PS5, doesn't that make me feel happy? Doesn't that help me? Doesn't that make me feel like I really, you know, I'm on the top of my game, I can do my thing, right? So utility, how much does it help me? Um, if I'm buying a house, right, do I need the biggest $5 million house I can find? Or can I settle for, you know, three fifty dollars or four hundred? dollars Even if I have the money, do I need all that house? So what's the utility of it, right? How much does it satisfy my needs? I don't need that much, okay? Now, along with demand, scarcity, if there isn't a lot of them, what's going to happen to the value? Price is going to go up, right? Price is going to move on. So, and we can, and I'm using the PS5, PlayStation 5, because that's what's happening here. There's a black market for PlayStation 5s, right? Um, you can't get them. So, what's happened to the price because of the scarcity? Prices have gone through the roof. Everybody wants one, right? So, demand and scarcity kind of work hand in hand. But if they're scarce, then um, obviously they um, the price goes up. What about, um, has anybody priced airline tickets lately? Everybody's flying. What's happening to the seats? Absolutely incredibly outrageous. So um, again, only because there's so many seats available and everybody wants them. So scarcity, right? Everybody wants what we got, so we're going to pay. I got a free vacation, literally seven days in St. Martin, and it's going to cost me $2,200 to get me there. So um, these are because everybody's flying. There's not, there's just scarce these, these seats. So same thing, right? Now, here's the other thing. The last, the T, transferability. If you can't sell your house, let's say you have a house that's worth $5 million and you have liens on it, you have judgments on it, they're going to, um, you can't, um, you owe a bunch of money on it and everything else. You can't make enough off of selling that house to, um, to not bring more money. Can you sell it? You can't sell it, right? How much is the value of a house you can't sell? Dollars and cents wise. Zero, right? It's worth nothing. So we need to be able to transfer it. We need to be able to buy and sell it. If we can't do that, it's not worth anything. So there's no value. So it's got to have demand, got to have utility, right? Um, scarcity adjusts the value and transferability. If I can't transfer it, it's not worth the powder to blow it up, right? I just got to stop stuck till like some things happen. So there is no value, right? So these are the four elements of the characteristics of value, right? Demand, utility, scarcity, transferability. A market value is the most probable price a property will bring in a competitive and open market. An arm's length transaction. And what I mean by an arm's length transaction is two people acting under no undue influence, shaking hands and saying, yes, I'm willing to pay it. And the other party saying, yes, I'm willing to sell it for that particular piece of property. We're not doing it under duress. We're not doing it as a, um, an estate sale. We're not doing it as a foreclosure. We're not doing anything that's distress. Okay. This is a, um, this is a um, arm's length transaction. 
All right. So the buyer and seller are each acting prudently, knowledgeably, and without undue influence. This is the value. Okay. This is the value. Now, there's a difference between market value and market price. Market value is the appraisal process. They're going to give you an opinion of value. The market price is what? What it was paid for, right? What who would they pay for it? The buyer and seller acting independently. What this is the value they they put on the, the price they put on the house. It could be different from the um, appraisal price. It could be more. It could be less. But that's the price. The price is what they paid for it. And our probable sales price is going to be as long as you're the broker and not the appraiser. It's going to be a probable sales price. All right. So, uh, market value by the appraiser. Market price, the buyer and seller together, figuring out what they're going to pay for it. And a probable sales price is the broker doing a comparative market analysis. So now we have other things that affect value. These outside forces that affect value. And we're going to talk about social, economic, political, and physical forces. All right. These things outside of, uh, a lot of times outside of our control, these things affect our value also. All right. So the first one is social forces, trends in marriage, divorce rates, family size, longevity, the desirability of social forces. All right. You know, maybe we're going to, um, where does our family live? We want to be close to the family if we're very close to family. We don't want to be so far away. Maybe we need to get back. Maybe um, there's a family farm that I inherited. I need to get back. Right. So those are social forces. Those are social forces, things that make me come back. Maybe we have a divorce. In that particular case, I got to go find a place to live. Maybe my spouse wants to go back and live by her family. All right. So those are all social forces. All right. The second one is economic forces. What happens when they close the plant in the steel town? What happens to the houses? What happens to the people? They're out of there, right? People are out of there. They're gone. What's happening to the value? Yeah, there's no jobs. So what's happening to the value of their properties? There's no work, right? There's no work. I'm not going to buy a house in the community. There's no work. What do I got to pay for the house, right? So their value drops. This is another force, right? Income and employment levels, rate of property taxation, current interest rates, general economic growth. Um, what if I, um, if I told you tomorrow that North Carolina is going to put a tax on your property, an additional 10% to pay for infrastructure. Would that make North Carolina that more uh, that much more attractive to people moving from out of state to pay 10% more on their house value because they have, they're going to do roads? No. And again, I'm just making that up, but you can see that that would affect people wanting to come in there. So these are economic forces, higher taxation. Would you rather be taxed at New York City rates or would you rather be taxed at uh, Wilmington, North Carolina rates? I tell you, it's a lot cheaper to live in Wilmington, right? It's a lot cheaper to live in Wilmington. So again, better, you know, if we can, if it's possible. One of the reasons we had the big rush during COVID for North and Car South Carolina real estate was why? Because people could escape the cities, work remotely, buy houses in other places, and still keep their city job or still keep their, you know, their big job at lower expenses, right? Lower expenses. It's one of the reasons that we had such a job, uh, such a housing push. Economic forces, less expensive. We also have what? Political forces, zoning codes, building codes, right? Growth management, environmental legislation, tax structures. We had a, a, a thing down here in the county that I live in where they wanted to make the builders pay an environmental impacts uh, fee of almost $6,000 per house, every new house that they built for infrastructure, for roads, for lights, for traffic, for everything. Do you think that would have hurt builders when if they had to pay every house that they build, they had to pay $6,000 extra? right, for that? Now, did we need the infrastructure? Yeah, we did. But if, if who, the builder's not going to pay for that, right? What's the builder going to do? Yeah, exactly right, James. He's going to pass it to the buyers. So that means the pricing of the housing is going to go up. 
which makes it less attractive on the buyer side. And you can see how the water runs downhill. That's one of the things. It turns out that they had a meeting and it only, it's only going to cost them 1500 versus 6000 which seemed accept, acceptable to a lot of people. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where if they're building a, if they're building a, a development, they got to come up with $1,500 a house to pay for the infrastructure. Doesn't seem like enough, but okay. So those are things that would slow it down. What if um, we're, we all live on one acre lots? And then the zoning board says, you know what? We're going to change your one acre lots and we're going to make it quarter acre lots. So now instead of that big one acre lot that you had, all around you are going to have um, four houses on an acre. It's going to crowd it up a little bit, is it not? Is it going to make it more attractive? It's going to look, make it look crowded, right? So again, these are things that because of a government change, that might not be um, uh, beneficial. It might influence the value of the properties. Mm -hmm. So that's political forces. And the last one is physical forces. Topography, location, climate, size, shape, proximity to major arterials, jobs, public transportation. After Florence, how much was Topsail real estate going for? All of that stuff that got blown away by the hurricane. You can get it for pretty much nothing at that point, right? Yeah, now you can't because they rebuilt. But during that period of time, if you wanted to take on the burden of rebuilding, you could have got something relatively inexpensively, right? Or any of the barrier islands for that matter, right? That's a physical force, right? Weather, hurricanes, you know, sinkholes, anything else like that that comes and goes. Hatteras, you go out to Hatteras, right? That lighthouse is underwater most of the times anyway. So um, you wouldn't want to build a house up there. You go up to, um, what is it, Corolla up that way if you're out on the islands, right? Go up that way, it's beautiful out there, but I'm, I'm not building my house on that beach, right? I'm not building my house on that beach, right? I don't want my house in the ocean, sorry, right? Horses are no horses, right? So again, these things are physical forces, right? We have social forces, economic forces, political forces, and then physical forces, right? All these things influence our values, they all do. Some basic other influences, right? Principles. We're going to talk about highest and best use, talk about substitution, supply and demand, um, conformity, anticipation, contribution, um, and then we're going to talk about competition and change. But one that we're going to talk about in particular, all right, when we get there is substitution, because you're going to deal with the principle of substitution all the time, all right? So the first one we're gonna talk about is highest and best use. And highest and best use says that we have a piece of land. What's the best possible use for that piece of land? Do we need 500 more homes? Maybe we do, I'm not saying we don't. Maybe we need what? Um, maybe we need a school because we just put 500 homes in. Maybe we need some green space. Maybe we need a medical center. So what's the highest use of that property? What's the best use of the property, right? So take some time to develop that. We need to do a study. What do we need here? Do we need a grocery store? We just built 500 homes over across the street and our closest fire and rescue is 10 miles away. Do you think we might need a fire station pretty close? I would say that's probably a pretty good idea, right? Maybe we need a, a, a police mini station here. Maybe we need one of those uh, urgent care buildings here. Who knows, right? Whatever the development needs, whatever the surrounding area needs. Instead of building 500 more homes, let's figure out what they need. Maybe use that first. So that's the highest and best use, okay? That's the highest and best use. Now, principle of substitution. I told you that you, um, you're gonna use this. If you're working with a seller, and your seller overprices their house. It doesn't match the conformity of the others. Now, it can be a little bit better, it can be a little bit less, but if it's significantly better, you are gonna help your neighbor sell their house through the principle of substitution. So what's gonna happen, let's use this example. Everybody in the neighborhood is listed and they've sold for about $275,000. 
my seller wants to sell his house for $310,000. I'm going to have to prove to everybody what that $45,000 value is. And it had better be worth $45,000 because if not, what are they going to do? They're going to buy the less expensive one. They're going to substitute it and say, I can put that in later if I really want it, right? For less money, for less money. So principle states that when the several items with essentially the same amenities and utilities are available, the lower priced item will have the most demand, okay? Lower priced item will have the most demand. How many of you have crown molding in your house? You put a big value on crown molding in your house? I can put it in your house for $10 a foot. There are people who, because they have crown molding, will put $25 value, a $25,000 value on their property. So it's not one of those things that carries a lot of value except for the person who bought it. Now, I can tell you that if you overprice your house because you have crown molding, you better have something else. Because if I can save $25,000 by going down the street and not having crown molding, guess what I'm going to do? As long as there's not a significant difference in time, if I can get used both at the same time. Now, if I had to wait six or eight months to get that house down the street, I might look at this one because it's a little more expensive, but I can get it quicker. But if I can get one at the same time, I'm going to take the cheaper one. I'm always going to get the less expensive one. And then later on, I'll put it in at wholesale, not retail, because you're going to charge retail. So that's the principle of substitution. You're going to overprice your house. You better prove that. All right. You're going to have to prove it. So, um, and otherwise you're going to help your neighbor sell their house because they're going to look at your, theirs and compare it. They're going to be a bargain versus what you want for your house. And that's just the way the law works. That's just the way it is. That's what people do. Okay. They will substitute, look for the bargain. And that would be a better bargain. So unless it's noticeable, unless there's a uh, lack of time, right? At that particular point, they're always going to take the lower price type. All right, so that's why you got to tell your your seller that you've got to pro price it properly. Now, if everything's selling at two seventy five and he wants to price it at two eighty five, everything's negotiable. He's in the ballpark, but if he's way out or she's way out, it's not going to sell. Not going to sell, right? Or it'll sell later than all the other ones. All right, supply and demand. We all know what supply and demand is, right? The more demand, the less supply, the higher the value, right? The more supply, the less demand, the lower the value. It's as simple as that. You learn that in fifth grade, supply and demand, nothing changes. It goes on and on. That's the way the principle works. Principle of conformity. If I have a community with 200 one-story ranches on it, nice houses, but they're all one-story ranches and pretty much the same. They're all going to maintain their value a little better than if all of a sudden I put five acres worth of um, duplexes. Let's say I build 20 duplexes behind this houses. It's going to change the dynamic, right? It's going to make it more crowded. It's going to make those duplexes are going to bring more people in. Maybe they're not built the same way. Maybe they're not as nice, right? Maybe they're not custom. They're just cracker boxes. So. Everything will maintain the value or lose the value based on conformity, based on conformity. If something's an outlier like these duplexes, it would change the feeling of the neighborhood. It would change what they think is the neighborhood. Maybe it seems to be crowded. Maybe with these duplexes, it doesn't make the same eye appeal, right? We could lose value. Um, let's say we had those houses and instead, if somebody's got a five acre field in the back and just for an over-exaggeration here, what if somebody built something that looked like Cinderella's castle back there? Yeah, custom house, build up, big spires, everything else in the middle of this neighborhood. Do you think they'll ever recoup the money that they'll get based on what they cost them because they live in this ranch neighborhood? No, they're never going to get that money back. Now, if I'm the house next door to the Cinderella's castle, will my value go up maybe? It's a simple ranch but it might go up a little bit, right? Because what, that unusual house that's built back there is, a, is bringing people, bringing interest to the community, good or bad, good or bad. People are coming, maybe they like it. So it might lift the prices, but everything will lift the same. Not much, but a little bit. 
But I can guarantee you that Cinderella's castle will never get the $10 million it took to build it. Never. If they're going to resell it, it wouldn't be worth it. So conformity matters, right? If you're in a community of uh, custom homes, well, everything's different. Everything's custom. That's different, right? That's what part of the community. If you're in, um, if you go into a community that has five or six different builders in there, sometimes that conformity gets a little bleary-eyed, right? You're all over the place. It's not really custom, but they're all, you know, you have five different major builders. So, and they're all priced differently. So it gets confusing. I know we have a couple of those developments there, right? Uh, that are here, same problem. What kind of house did you buy? You talk about this one neighborhood, this Clear Pond neighborhood, I'll give you the example. There, every, every different section was built by a different builder. I live in Clear Pond. Pond. Okay, yeah, who's your builder? And everyone has a different reputation. Everyone makes it, builds an absolute different house. All of them. So they all have different values. There are not, there's no conformity. And again, that makes it tough to price that house. Right. The principle of anticipation, the value of a property can increase or decrease based on some future benefit or detriment affecting the property. Who lives in Fayetteville or near Fayetteville? When they announced that they were going to put that Amazon warehouse, not when they started building it, but when they announced that they were going to put the Amazon warehouse out there, what happened to the property values around where they were going to build it? Did they go up? Yes, they did. They didn't even have to rope the area off. All of a sudden, I know where they're going to build. And guess what's happening? People are going to want to buy my house. They're going to want my property. Nothing's there yet. But the principle of anticipation says that something's coming. Let's make a move now. Right? So on both sides, people were willing to pay a little more for a premium to be closer to work. I'm willing to get a little more because I'm going to get out of here before it gets crazy. Right. So all of those things. And that's a pretty good example of what happens in that particular case. Right. So the principle of anticipation, something's going to happen here. Something's going to happen. We need to know what it is. Principle of contribution. Contribution is what affirms that the value of any component of a property is defined by what its addition can contribute to the value of the whole. Let's talk about swimming pools. I have a real nice built-in swimming pool. I love my swimming pool. All summer long, if I can get in it, I'm in it. There are people when I say, and I'm sure some of you in this class, I said I have a built-in swimming pool. And some of you, the hair on the back of your neck stood up and said, oh no, I have kids, I can't have a swimming pool. Is it worth a lot to me? Absolutely. Is it worth anything to Reagan? Would Reagan pay a premium to have that swimming pool in her backyard? Uh -uh -uh. I won't even go in your house. That's the principle of contribution. These things are worth different things to different people, right? Some people love swimming pools. Some people do not. Two car garages versus one car garage. Something as simple. Fireplaces. If you live down in Wilmington, down uh, Leland, somewhere in that area, you're not going to get, you know, your fireplace is nice, but it's not critical. If I'm in Boone, is a fireplace nice? and probably welcome, right? Again, different, all contribution, right? Probably well used also up in that Blowing Rock, Boone, all that area up there, right? You're constantly using wintertime um, wood. So everything matters, right? It all dep depends. Competition. This principle states that profits tend to attract competition. Excess profit can attract ruinous competition. Do you ever notice that why is there always four or five grocery stores or three grocery stores on the corner? Why is the Lowe's Foods right next to the Kroger? Or why is Publix right across the street from the Kroger? And why is Aldi down the street in that same area? Because competition is good. And if they can pick up, and the same thing for gas stations. Why are there four gas stations, one on each corner? All charging within pennies of each other. Well, this competition is good because it, means, it brings cars in, right? One guy's one good or not. Now, as long as they all maintain their facilities, things are good. Things work. This is good competition, right? You have to maintain it. But if someone decides all of a sudden that they're just going to become a mess, right, a farm stand, 
Well, then that's going to make the whole, they're going to blight the whole area because they made a lot of money. Now they don't really feel like working it and they sell it to somebody who don't know what they're doing, right? They don't take care of the building. They don't do all that stuff. So excess profit can attract ruinous competition. Sometimes we overbuild it, right? So there's a regulatory. So, but all these things, if you notice, now when you go around, you'll find out, look on the street corners. There's a gas station on every corner where there's a gas station. Same thing with grocery stores, they're clustered in, right? So all of those reasons. The last one we have here is the principle of change. And what this says is that no physical or economic condition remains constant. And we're going through a bit of that now, okay? We went through a huge period of growth, right? Everybody saw what happened with the houses the last couple of three years. Well, now what's happened is that we've kind of got to that plateau, but the interest rates have gone up because we want the prices to stop skyrocketing. So what's happened to sales a little bit? They've come down, right? So we go up, we come down, we flatten out, we'll grow again. So we have growth, stability, decline, and then renewal. That's the cycle. It, everything does that. Every single thing does that. Every business life cycle is that, all right? That's the principle of change. People get tired of um, coming to um, Wrightsville Beach, right? Maybe they, you know, Kitty Hawk isn't what it used to be, okay? Why? Well, because we've been there, done that, right? Let's do something different. Hard to get there. Not enough hotel room for whatever reason, right? For whatever reason. So just to use that as an example, and it goes up and down, cycles go up and down. They all change, right? They all change. So we have those. That's the principle of change. And it depends on where your life cycle is, where that life cycle is, right? Growth. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.